let's enjoy and participate in the session. So to run through it quickly, um, everyone's mic should be muted by default. Um, hopefully they are. Um, we'd all like you to we'd like you to join in as much as possible in the session, but please do keep your mics uh, muted just so we don't get any feedback and uh, any un, any kind of strange noises in the background. Um, but we really do want you to join in. So as you can see, you can chat um, and, and talk with the other participants and there's instructions up on the screen um, for, for how to do that. Uh, there's also the raised hand icon. Um, if we end, end up in any group discussions or anything, if, if you uh, raise your arm, then we can, with, with the little wavy icon down there, then we'll be able to see what um, that, that, that you'd like to speak and, 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 can, and can come to you. Um, I've, I've got to reiterate, um, as saying on the slide, that there could be younger people listening, so please uh, moderate any language in the in the chat and and obviously any content that you post up there. Uh, nothing offensive, please. Um, so uh, just to let you know, we've also got a questionnaire um, that um, if um, I'm just posting the link up there to it now. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you did manage to fill it in. Uh, you'll need to do it sometime if you're going to compete in the challenge, and then we'll provide a follow-on questionnaire uh, after the event. Uh, so the challenge itself, really quickly, I don't know if um, you managed to uh, catch this yesterday, but uh, what we want to do is that um, to win a prize in this, and it, it's a lovely Sarah's making um, some Sarah's making kits that uh, we've got as prizes. We'd really like you to use what you've learned over the over the week, the two weeks here. Uh, to show how you use the Internet of Things as an innovative solution to an environmental problem, um, as you heard yesterday. If you've got a make a kit, an Arduino or a micro bit, um, show us what you can do designing a circuit that solves a problem with you, uh, for you. But um, don't worry if you can't get your hands on any um, IoT components or electronics. Uh, please do then just show us what you could do in an, in an artwork, in a video. Uh, you know, tell your story about how your invention uh, helps to make a better environment and what role um, IoT plays in that solution. Um, so really, we're, you know, we're quite happy uh, for kind of uh, with submissions of designs if, or if you want to blend a design and some tech or do something with a tech app, um, that, that's all welcome. And I'm sure Tanya will, um, will be to help with all that as well. And um, Tanya will be judging the challenge. And, um, and so obviously do listen out to, for everything she's got to say today. Um, so, uh, so basically, however you do it, uh, with whatever materials, uh, what we're looking for are IoT theme creative designs. And we've got 20 free Seraz making kits um, for the best entry. And, um, and everyone who enters will get a, a fabulous digital badge from the Institute of Coding. Coding. So uh, many thanks. I'll hand you over to Tanya. Uh, I very much hope you enjoyed the event. And, um, and we're really excited about her talk today. So here we go, Tanya. Hello, hopefully you can see me. Can you see me? There's a, oh, organizers only. I'm sure that uh, Michael can sort out that one. You can see me, brilliant. Okay, I've got enough feedback on that one, brilliant. Uh, I see that uh, Zubia's raising their hand. I will come to that in a minute. So I'm gonna share my screen first and hopefully uh, you'll be able to see my slides as we go. So, there we go. Okay, can everybody see the slides all right? Expecting a wave of thumbs up. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, you can also see the thing that says, I'm showing my screen, so I'm not entirely sure how to change that, but never mind. We'll go with it anyway. So I'm going to take you from having an idea to starting to make your project. So all of the things that you might need to consider when you're making your project, plus a few ideas, some suggestions, and uh, hopefully by the end of it, you'll be overwhelmed with possibilities and you will be able to use your session tomorrow. Yes, I could click on hide. Thanks, Keys. Um, and you could use the session tomorrow with Kisha to come up with an idea. Uh, so hopefully then you'll have all the tools and the ideas. So I'm going to start with an intro. Hello. Um, I want to see if you can raise your hand. So on the bottom, there's the bit where your sort of mute microphone bit is. Yeah raise your hand and i can see five of you six of you brilliant cool so <laughs> okay now you can all lower your hand as well so if you click on the same button it should lower it again 
Um, and then if you need to ask me a question and you think I haven't seen it in the chat, if you put your hand up as well, it'll give me a little bump to kind of have a look at the chat and actually see what the questions are. Because obviously I'm trying to look at my own stuff as well as uh, the chat. So we've done the introductions. Um, I've said to ask any questions in the chat and I'll try and answer them. I'll read them out so that it's on the recording so that people can actually hear it as well. Um, so uh, first off, when you're doing Internet of Things stuff, which is what Stefan described yesterday, if you weren't here, it was basically making some way of interacting with the real world via the Internet or via some other communications network so that you can share information, make things smarter, make things more efficient um, and useful. Um, one of the things that, that I've done is something that was referred to yesterday was a, a plant monitor and my plant monitor is a technically an internet of things device you'll see that the plant um did not did not survive so well and that's not a fault of the internet of things that's a fault of me because whenever this thing emailed me to water my plant i was at work and the plant was at home so i probably ought to have come up with a better solution than that so the first step is to have an idea. So I'm going to follow through today with my, my plant monitor and um, hopefully that will sort of tie things together. So when you have your idea, and I've done this as a handout thing and I'll put it in the files later, you need to start thinking about what is it for? What information is it going to get? What sensors? I realise I'm reading out the slide here, but basically you need to think about all the things that you want it to do and how you want it to do them. So if you can see this one, it's a happy little cactus, but if we turn it round, there's a nightmare of wires. So it is for monitoring my plant and it gets the information of how, how sort of wet the soil is, which is what this little prong thing is here. That's a soil moisture sensor. So that's the sensor that I needed. It'll be kept in the plant pot, so I have to make sure that it's sort of a bit splash proof and also, you know, has a way of staying in the plant pot, which is just plugging into the soil there. And how I was going to get the information back was through the Internet of Things, of course. So I used a Raspberry Pi, which can connect to Wi-Fi and it connected to my home Wi-Fi. And every time that the moisture dropped below a certain level, it would send me an email. But the thing is, is that when I made this, I made this maybe four years ago and I didn't know anything really about Internet of Things. So we need to think about what we already know and where we can go from there. So I had a little think. I put it here. I'm going to put this in the files. I don't know if you know where files is, but if you've got the text bit open, the chat bit open, if you look to them, it's like the little people with how many attendees and to the right of that, there's a content bit and you should be able to see the files that have been shared in there. I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to wait for a response in the chat to see if anybody can actually see that yet. Not showing for you. OK, so this is where I invoke Michael and say, Michael, can you do the share files bit, please? Because that would be useful. If not, then we'll just upload I'm them. On it. Brilliant. If not, what? We'll... Okay. So we're sorting that out now. Thank you for looking. Um, so we'll we either put them on the Ceras website or they will be there for you. So the what I can do. Is... Sharing? Sorry, Tony. Um, the links you want sharing. It's I put links in and the where do I start as well. So what I can do is I can swap between them. Or at least okay. Can. Uh, the where do I start? Not that first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I've done that as a, a little PDF. So you can, you'll be able to download that after the session to help you maybe structure your thoughts about your initial idea. But you might not have an idea yet, which is where Kisha's session tomorrow comes in. And she'll help you come up with some ideas if you're a little bit stuck. So have idea, will plan. That's the general idea. Can you go back to, um, or can I go back to sharing my screen? You should be able to do that now. Oh, splendid. There, there we go. OK, so I'm back to that. And I've put this as a handout as well. Shreya, so you have a question? If you have a question, pop it in the chat there and then I'll be able to read it. OK, 
Um, so when we've thought about what we actually want to do, what we've thought about what we actually want to do, what we need to do then is think about the steps of doing it. Now I can see that some people are raising their hands. If you do have a question, do pop it in the chat because then I can read it out and we can record it on the video and put along with the answer. So the steps that I do when I want to collect something is I think about I need a device. I need something to collect that data. I need some sensors which are good at reading particular types of data, of data and something to put it all in. We're powering it and then some way of sharing it because this is the Internet of things. Devices have to be connected. If you're not sure what the symbols are there, there's Wi-Fi, there's Bluetooth named after a 14th century Viking, I believe. Um, and there's also uh, USB. OK, so we haven't managed to be able to share the files right now. But it doesn't matter because they'll be on my screen as I'm doing the talk. But afterwards, we will share them on the website. So anything that says this is a handout, you'll be able to get on there. Um, right. So these are the steps. It seems pretty simple. But the thing is, with each of these steps, there's a choice. And with each choice, it depends on what you're doing and what the best tool for the job is and on your skill level. So there's all sorts of things that it will depend on. And did I go forwards and backwards? Forwards and backwards. Let's start with the device that collects data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. and I'm going to swap back over. Yeah, you can do a screen, a screen grab if you want. That's fine. But I am going to go back to just my, my camera. So I need to stop sharing my screen. And I don't know if it can pin me as the large picture, but hopefully you'll be able to see it. Speaker mode. Can you see me as the largest picture there, or have we just got Michael's lovely picture? OK, so what I want to show you is the lovely beard man. Yes, that's another way of describing Michael. So I don't know if Michael could change that, but um, if you make me as the main person. Oh, OK. Because um, I want to show you stuff on the video and obviously like the bigger it is, the easier you can see it. So I'm trying to hold up a Raspberry Pi here, but it's going to be a tricky one. It might be down to your individual settings. I, interrupt and I think everybody can change that to their individual settings by clicking on the little four block box in the top right hand corner of the screen. Mm -hmm. So in the screen where you're, all the faces appear right now, if you click on that, uh, that should change it from uh, group chat, Richard and you and me and everybody else, and to um, focusing on you so we see you bigger. Okay, so I love the description Carmen's just done in the chat. That's it, Carmen. Yeah. Press Carmen, the little Carmen. squares in the corner and Tanya gets bigger. It's like yeah. the giant, <laughs> giant and then shrinking. I'm going to find myself enclosed in the room like this in a minute. Anyway, thank you, Carmen. So That's hopefully. Perfect. Thank you. Hopefully you can you can now see my screen a lot bigger. So this one's a Raspberry Pi and this is a Raspberry Pi Zero and they are really quite small. My hands are quite big, but you can see how tiny they are compared to a human hand. There we go. Um, and so this is probably the, the smallest full computer that you can get. And this has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on board and it has what's called pins. See all these little holes here. Those are all connections that you can put sensors on. Some of them are only for digital sensors. Some are only for analog sensors. But on the whole, you've got loads of them. Um, but sometimes something like this is a bit overkill. So what I've got here, uh, that's not a Raspberry Pi 2. That's a Raspberry Pi Zero. So there's different types of Raspberry Pi. There's a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is the smallest one. Then you've got a Pi A or A plus, which is a little bit bigger. It's about this big. I haven't got one, so I can't show you. And then I've got a Pi. Oh, gosh, this one's plugged in. I'm just going to unplug it because the demo is not working. This is a Pi 3 B plus, And that size is the main Raspberry Pi size. There's also a Raspberry Pi 4. I wouldn't suggest, unless you're doing a massive amount of processing, that you ever use a Raspberry Pi 4 for Internet of Things devices, because it's, it's a lot of money and it's a bit of an overkill. But if you can find a, a 3, 3 Bs, there and three B pluses, they're really good. 
it very much depends, Iram, on, sorry if I've mispronounced your name, on which one you want for your project and what you want it to do. So Raspberry Pis all do the same thing, but they do it in different ways. So some of them are slow and some of them are fast. Some of them um, are more expensive than others. Some of them are big, some of them are small. So it depends what you want to do with your project, but they do all, unless you go right back in time, have the same amount of pins. So you can see on this one, see those pins there? I've connected three wires to mine and they're just sort of slide on, slide off. So it's quite easy to connect things to it. But you might not need something that complicated. You might need something tiny. So this one here, whoop, there we go. This one here is actually called a teensy because it is teensy. And you can see the pins sticking out the side there. I've soldered them on so that they come out to the side because this one powers a dress and I have a dress that does different light patterns depending on what I'm doing. And that's all that powers that is that tiny, tiny tinsy, as it were. But there's only about six pins on there that you can actually use. The other ones are just for power and ground. So it depends how many sensors you want to attach. Uh, it depends how complicated you want it to, to do things. And it depends whether you want it to just record information or whether you want it to record the information and process it and do something with it. Um, if you want to do something that interacts with the internet a bit more, like, you know, we'll tweet out the current temperature in your room, then something like a Raspberry Pi is a good idea. If you want something to just take readings and monitor things, then a tiny one will do. Uh, this TNC is uh, actually that one's a trinket. <laughs> this one's a TNC. I've got so many that are just sat around the sides. So this one is a trinket. I've also got another one here. So I've got different versions. There's one there, one there. And you can see how they come. They come with these holes for you to put headers on, which are connectors for pins. Or what you can do is you can attach your wires directly to those little gold bits, which are still called pins, even though they don't stick up. Um, again, you get different types. You get ones that use low power. You get ones that use high power. And you have to make sure you've got the right one. So usually you can see on it. So on this one, if I look on the back of it, it says five volt logic. It's going to be really hard to see, but you might be able to see it there. It says five volt logic on the back of that one. Uh, and on this one is three volt logic. So if I plug five volts into this one, it's going to go there and die. So it's very, very important to know about power. But I'm going to come back to that later. So the device that collects data is the sort of the main thing that you're going to have to consider. And I'm going to go back to my slides now. I've finished holding things up. I think I've finished holding things up. Oh, no, I've got one more to hold up, two more to hold up. I lied. There's a micro bit which is probably the easiest one to get started on. If you've never programmed a microcontroller before, which is basically something that takes information and does something with it, uh, a microcontroller, a um, micro bit is the easiest one to do. And they can talk to other micro bits. So I have this one here and I have another one. This one's in a, a cat housing because it looks like an angry tiger. Urgh. Sorry. Um, but they can talk to each other. So this one I put on a battery pack and I, I strap it to my friend who does circus tricks. And when he does his circus tricks, it sends the data wirelessly to this one, which is attached to my computer. And then I can upload the information to the Internet and everybody can see how much G-force he's putting his body through when he's doing his circus tricks. So it's it's a very straightforward one to get started. And you can program that one without knowing how to code at all. But um, it's sort of like top trumps, and I'll come to that later. I'm going to switch back to my slides, if I can find my mouse pointer, which is great. There we go, back to that one. Welcome, Gabrielle. You've uh, you've missed me waving things around and, and dropping things mostly. So, um, so we've talked about having an idea. We've talked about the, the general plan and how to sort of sketch out your rough idea. And we've talked about um the kind of steps that you need to consider we're now looking at the types of board so there's my beautiful drawings of a raspberry pi a micro bit arduinos there's loads of different arduinos if you um if you're super skint which i often am i've thrown it on the floor <laughs> I told you i've thrown things on the floor 
Okay, if you're super skin, you can get this one for £1.50. Uh, it's called a, an AT Tiny 85, and it's basically connected with USB to your computer. You program it using the Arduino thing, and it has five pins. There's ones along the edge there. See those little silver ones? It has five pins, and you can actually use that to control all sorts of things. Um, but it has no Wi-Fi. It has no Bluetooth. It has nothing like that. But because you can connect it with uh, a USB lead to your computer, your computer has Wi-Fi, and you can use that as a sort of interface between things. So this becomes the smart device that is then connected to your computer, albeit physically through a lead, but then you can connect it to the wider world and the internet. So the choices are huge. Um, Aram's asking, for example, how is it used as an interface? Um, so for this one, what I could do is I could attach maybe a temperature sensor and I could leave it somewhere where, I don't know, maybe my food's going off sat in the side in the kitchen. So I can leave it in the kitchen, sat in the side and get a USB lead and connect it over to my computer. And it can sit there monitoring the temperature throughout the day so I can get a better picture of, oh, the sun's coming in through the window and it's shining on that bit for two hours. And I know that that's why my food's going off or something like that. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. If you've got any more, just pop them in the chat. Uh, Shamal has asked, can different brands of board communicate? Um, yes, but it depends on the system. And sometimes um, you'll have trouble. So if you wanted to get a micro bit talking to an Arduino, for example, um, it is possible because they can use a, a similar communication setup. So you could use um, Bluetooth to communicate between them. But Microbit talks one language, Arduino talks another language, and you're going to have to do some sort of translating in the middle. So it makes it more complicated for yourself, but it, it is possible. I wouldn't say it would be a beginner's project, though. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. OK, so in case you didn't see me holding them up, I've got some actual pictures of them as well, including another one that's one of my favourites. But again, is um, really widely written about, but difficult to connect to the internet in that it hasn't got anything on board. So that trinket, that was the one that I was holding up, is on the top right there. A micro bit, a Raspberry Pi at the bottom. That's a Raspberry Pi 4 in that picture. The top left is an Arduino um, maker. I'm not sure how you're supposed to pronounce it. It's it's written MKR. And this is the Arduino maker. It's about £30, so on the sort of higher end of things. But it is internet connected by default so it has a wi-fi chip on there loads of pins don't know if you can see all the pins there and on the top it has little push in connectors which is something to consider if you're not very good at soldering then you might want to use something called jerky wires and jerky wires are just wires with connectors on the end that you push onto pins or into into uh, headers which are the sort of holes for pins there we go so you can connect things up that way if you don't like soldering. Has anybody here soldered before? Tell me in the chat if you have soldered before and your experiences with that, that would be useful. Yeah, oh, we've got a lot of solderers. Well, that's great. Long time ago, that's the perfect opportunity to get your soldering iron back out. So um, we've got a lot of people who solder, brilliant. So. If you want to get out your soldering iron, then you can connect your pins up. But the other thing you might want is you might want a breadboard. Oh, if you, Emma says she doesn't have a soldering iron. My top tip is on, on the interwebs, because that's where we get everything at the moment, you can get a USB soldering iron. They're about five to ten pounds and they just plug into any USB um, plug and then you just solder away so you don't need to sort of fancy station there you have one temperature really but it's enough to get pins connected and the other brilliant thing is is that when you go to hacker camps and you're sitting in the middle of a field you can get out your power bank and your usb soldering iron and you can solder in the middle of uh, if a field if you want to which is really good because the ventilation is perfect um Ah, Olivia loves to solder. Marvellous. Um, I'm very, very happy about that because I'm an aficionado of soldering and I love it very much. But I've got distracted about soldering. So we we'll go back to connecting things on. If you ever look at the micro bit on the picture there, it's got some bigger, fatter pins. And so another way that you can connect things 
is via crocodile clips. So you might be able, if you go in on the sort of very basic um, starting off at this, then you might want to use a micro bit and some crocodile clips because that's how you do a connection. You just literally clip it on. If you want to go super advanced, then if you look really closely at the micro bit, you'll see there's some pins in between the bigger pins. And those pins in between the bigger pins are also pins. I think there's 23. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. I'd have to sit there and count them and that would not make for very good telly, would it? OK, so another thing when you're picking a board is I would say some of them are really popular, which means that lots and lots of people have done projects with them. And you can see lots and lots of examples of what other people have done with them. So here are all the things we've been talking about. Cost is obviously a thing. So I showed you the cheapest board I had there was £1.50. Um, the most expensive one I have was probably, I think, the Raspberry Pi. Um, this one, Pi 3D, I think it was about £35. So that one's about £35. But in a push, you can actually use it as a desktop computer if you don't mind it going a bit slow. Oh, that's the other thing. Iram was asking which Raspberry Pi to choose. This one is so slow. You know when you load the internet and you have a really bad connection? and you're just sitting there waiting for it to work. That's basically the experience with this if you try and get it to do anything complicated. But if you're only doing something simple like taking temperature readings and sending that via Wi-Fi, yeah, use one. If you want to do something horrendously complicated, like an industrial system, use a bigger one. Um, we talked about skills. We've talked about the soldering and circuit design. It takes a bit of getting used to, but again, it's just basically following the route how does the electricity work? Sorry, Keats is saying here, yeah, they grew up on dial-up internet and everything is fast. I feel the pain. Yeah, I feel that. I remember when the internet used to come on a CD-ROM. Anyway, so how are you going to use it? Is it going to need to do something complicated? If not, pick something cheap and cheerful. Do you only need to attach two sensors? You don't need that many pins then. So you think about how many things you're going to attach, how many pins are you going to need? But when I come to sensors, you'll see that most sensors have at least two pins, one in, one out. So you're going to have to think about, you know, I've only got one sensor, I only need one pin. No, you're going to need at least two. Um, some of these have built in extras as well. Oh, I can't believe I didn't tell you about the built in extras on the micro bit. Let's grab the micro bit. So this micro bit has an accelerometer on it. So this is why I can attach it to my circus friend. and we can measure all the forces on him because it has a three-way accelerometer. Like on your phone, you know when you tilt your phone the other way around and the screen changes? Um, that's using an accelerometer. There's an accelerometer in this. There's also um, a compass, so it can detect where it is in the Earth's magnetic field. There's, you can also use that to sort of use a magnet to change things on it, which is quite fun. There's a light sensor and there's a temperature sensor of sorts. It senses the temperature of the processor on it. So it's not really a proper temperature sensor, but it's easy enough to get one and connect one anyway. But some of these have extras. So again, look up the one you're thinking of using and look at what it comes with and what you're going to have to attach to it, because it might be cheaper to get something that has everything built in than attaching things. I also mentioned location as well. This is another reason why the, the Pi Zero is really popular. It's because it's small and it's easy to fit in places. So a lot of people use these for outdoor monitors where they're going to have to hide something in a bird box because you don't want all these ginormous projects hiding in there. OK, how am I doing for time? I'm doing all right for time. Yay, this is good. I do worry about running out of time and nobody having any, uh, any chance to ask questions. So um yeah this is where we might be at at the moment we might be at the erm point of there are so many things and we're just getting started what controller do i use i don't know it's okay to be erm at this stage because if you don't know what you're going to use then that means you've got a lovely research project ahead of you because you've got loads of different things to try out i would say if you can't choose i would go for um a raspberry pi a micro bit or an Arduino with Wi-Fi built in. If you're a beginner, microbit. If you're in the middle, Raspberry Pi. If you're advanced, Arduino. But you're going to have some sessions on microbit and Arduino later on, so you'll be able to see if they're sort of the thing for you or not. 
it's basically like playing a game. You have to weigh up the good bits and the bad bits. And in some areas, a board will be better for you. And in other areas, a different board will be better for you. So you've got to think about which one matches most of your needs. And if there isn't one that matches most of your needs, then you invent a new board and you sell it on the Internet and you get super rich. There's some people who have done that. Anyway, um, a question. Um, what purpose Internet of Things practices would serve beyond prototypes? Good question. Um, a lot of this is about a learning process. So you might be making an Internet of Things device just so you can learn how things work and how things interact and have a better understanding of the world around you. You might start off doing a prototype and then think, well, actually, I want to develop this further. I want to make this into a product. And there's there's a lot of startups doing that. There's um, I'm trying to think of ones that I haven't got an NDA with. Um, so there's ones that might be coming up with some, maybe an environmental monitor and they want to then make that environmental monitor into a product that somebody can buy instead of just their little prototype. And there's various things that you have to refine, but it, it's possible. Uh, some people get investment and then build on that. Some people build fancy housings for it instead of just using a lunchbox. So I think as a stepping point, it's a good start with your prototype. If you want to take it further, there's numerous means to do that. Uh, Zubia is asking, would I prefer an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi for a project. I prefer Raspberry Pi because I code in Python. I'm not as familiar with the Arduino interface, the Arduino IDE as it's called. Um, and so I struggle a little bit and I have to rely heavily on what other people have done and go, oh, that's how it works and then change that to meet my needs. So I would say if I was choosing, I'd pick a Raspberry Pi and I'd probably pick a Raspberry Pi Zero because they're small and they're fairly cheap. They're about 12 pounds. Um, but an Arduino, you can't beat for variety. So again, it's it's entirely individual. Right, where are we going next? Oh, the world of sensors. Oh, right, okay. Sensors are awesome. They are cheap as chips, in plentiful supply, and you can get loads of them to do all sorts of different things. So I'm going to do a little experiment now. I would like you in the chat to see if you can recognize any of those sensors. Trick is a few of those in the big picture aren't actually sensors, but most of them are sensors. Um, try and see if you can spot any type of sensor or have a guess as to what any of those might be. I'm going to get some actual sensors out, but I'm going to mute my microphone so the crackly bags don't annoy you. OK, brilliant. We've got some uh, a relay. Yeah, there's a relay in there. Humidity sensor. Well spotted. There is a humidity sensor in there. Uh, infrared. Yeah. If you don't know what infrared is, it's the thing that your TV clicker usually works on. Two people saying that we've got temperature sensor. Correct. A joystick. Yeah. Which is sensing whether you're pushing it or not. We've got a light sensor. Yeah. Uh, just trying to see which one is the easiest one to point out as a light sensor. Um, oh, yeah, on the right hand side, this one uh, is one, two, three. Four. It's the second from the bottom. We've got a microphone. Yes. So microphones can be used to detect sounds. Um, so like there's obviously one detecting me speaking, but you can also use a microphone to detect things like a clap or a tap. So sometimes they're, they're called um, sound sensors rather than microphones. Um, sound IR hall effect. So Daniel's mentioned that there's the hall effect sensor and a hall effect sensor is one that detects a magnetic field. If you've got a bike and you've got um, like a mileometer on it or something that tells you what speed you're going, you've probably got a hall effect sensor on your bike and a little magnet on the wheel. So if you have one you want to go and have a look later, you're looking for a little magnet on the wheel and some little box that has some sort of device in it. The Hall effect sensor is on the red ones. It's the second one down. And it's that little black blob on three sticks. That's the Hall effect sensor. And that will detect when the magnetic field around it changes. So what else have we got? Humidity. Yep, we have a humidity sensor. Um, thermistor. So that's uh, 
Results, changes, depend, changes resistance based on temperature, accelerometer. Uh, yeah. So you've spotted loads on there. Brilliant. OK, so who spotted the flame sensor? Nobody spotted the flame sensor. OK, the flame sensor was one I got. Um, I got a multi pack and it had loads of different sensors in. And I was flicking through them and thinking, what does this one do? What does that one do? And I had a little look on the Internet because that's what you do when you've got something you're not sure what it is. And it turns out it was a flame sensor. And so what I was able to do was if I change my screen. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, come on, YouTube. I probably should have preloaded this one, but never, never mind. So what I did with my flame sensor was I made a little fireplace that would light uh, with an actual, uh, it says it says my connection is poor right now. That would be the dog watching YouTube downstairs. I don't leave the telly on for my dog. Let's we can put a link to this later if you want. Um, if you want to share that, anything else you want to do? Yeah, I think that might Twitter be Twitter and the YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay, so you can't see it actually working, but we'll uh, we'll just press pause there or close it off. Yes, it's decided to load the whole of YouTube. So we'll just go back to the slides instead, <laughs> which have decided to get stuck. Right, here we are. So the, the flame sensor was one. Sorry, everything's always a little bit slower. It was one where you get a flame near it and it uses that as a switch. So what I was able to do was uh, make this little fireplace and I used a micro bit. So that was one of the ones that I referred to earlier, microbit being really, really easy to program. And uh, this was programmed just using block code, which we'll take a look at later. So the microbit, you can see the pins there. The flame sensor is this. Can you see my pointer? Yes, you can. Brilliant. So this is the flame sensor. It has a little dial here so you can adjust the sensitivity. And this is a little um, receiver that will detect the flame. Uh, we connect it up. So it needs power on ground and then a pin to send its signal on and I attached it to a light strip. So basically the lights would come on and it would do a flickery fire when I lit it with a flame. So there are all sorts of sensors, but a flame sensor needn't be for something daft like this. A flame sensor could be for something evil. Uh, let's look at the video. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to go back there to World of Sensors and I'm going to start holding a few things up again. So. I've got just loads and loads of little sensors, and sometimes I just try and build a project based on whatever sensor I've got. So you can get loads of different ones. What's this one? Oh, this one's a, a we've got a gas sensor. So gas sensors are quite fun. Uh, this one's also a gas sensor. So it heats up the air going over it, and it looks for changes based on uh, what gases are in the atmosphere. Some of them, it won't tell you like, oh, this is methane, but it will tell you this is a group of um whatever type of gases volatile gases are in this atmosphere and again you'll see each one has little pins and the little pins connect up to the pins on your device uh michael's having a little chat in the chat about uh, ancient ancient history i'm going to mock him so now i have a handful of sensors which i'm just going to put to one side and sort out later get distracted by the chat maybe i should maybe i should hide it for a bit right so um the sensors have pins your device has pins you need to come up and how to connect them up is usually on what's called a data sheet for the sensor which you can usually look up on the internet and find out so um if you want to know which pins to connect to there's something really really useful and i'm going to show you a site pinout.xyz if it loads. I should have loaded this one already as well, but there we go. Uh, Pinout.xyz will show you which pins connect to which. So it will show you all the different pins on a Raspberry Pi, for example. There's also a version for Microbit as well. And you can also look at which ones clash with other ones if you have problems. So there's all sorts of ways that you can wire different things up and you can have a look through there how to, how to do all the connections. Now, people who are worrying about links do not care. Yeah, I have done you a doc. Oh, wow, my connection really is bad, which lists all those sensors that we've just talked about, plus other ones that I didn't actually talk about. 
and a billion different links for you to click on, including the previous talks. So this is the Cirrus YouTube channel, so that you'll be able to look at this talk and the other talks as well. So that will be available afterwards as well. Um, so not a problem. Right, we're going to take a look at coding while we're out of here. The um, fireplace that I did was coded in um, block code. So if you go to makecode.com, which again is in, in the links, you can click on the micro bit and that will take you to something which we can code in blocks. And if we pedal really fast, then the internet will come up to speed. There we go. And all these are a little blocks that you move into here and you put them together to make a program. So when I shake it, I want it to show um, the word hell, for example, but that one's rubbish, so I don't actually need that one. Um, I can get it to show a number. So when I shake it, it shows a number, and that number is helpful, the temperature. And you just plop that in there. And then that's a program, and you download it, and you connect your micro bit up with a USB thing, and then that program, when you shake it, it shows the temperature, is done. So it's actually a really simple way of programming. And there's loads and loads of tutorials on the micro bit website, which again I have linked to for later. And that's one way of programming. Another way of programming is to use Python. Um, uh, yeah, it does look like Scratch. Wesley says it looks like Scratch. Scratch is also another way of using uh, ways to program it, but I find this one is, is quite good because you can also look at live data on it. So you can connect it up via serial and then use live data. Um, I don't know if I can do that right now. No, I can't because I've only got one USB port on this laptop, which is the wonders of streamlining and bad design. So I can't connect up the micro bit at the same time. But what you can do is you can live stream the data coming from your micro bit, which is brilliant. Um, Python is a, a sort of wordy version. So this one is basically doing the exact same thing on a micro bit. It's saying on the micro bit, while, it, while it's true and basically whenever we're doing it, wait a little bit, print the temperature, wait a little bit, print the temperature, wait a little bit the temperature so you can see that all that's doing is it's just showing the temperature every five seconds or so i should have done a shake one so it was a direct comparison however if you want to take the temperature on an arduino this is the code <laughs> now you might have to squint a little bit i don't know if i can zoom in or, or anything like that but basically um arduino is more and more complicated but much more versatile so it depends on your skill level as to where you're going to start with your coding so you might want to start off with block code you might be happy with python you might want to move to, to programming for the arduino and again that's a download by usb onto your device same with the python as well now i'm using an editor called new which i find a really easy one because it has nice simple buttons so flash is basically plug in your micro bit press that it'll load it on it also has useful things like check, which will check to see if you've made any problems. Yeah, David will do all this micro bit stuff. Oh, brilliant. He's going to use Blocky as well. Blocky ones and MicroPython. And Keys says there is a Zoom function on the top left if you're having trouble seeing any of this code. But I am going to come out of it now so that you'll be able to see something else. Um, if you're in between blocks and Python, there's something that's really, really clever called edu blocks. And again, I've linked it in the link, so you don't need to worry about copying the code now. Um, but you can see that all the blocks have what the Python code looks like when it's written on them so that you don't have any of the syntax problems or how I put the dot in the wrong place and things like that. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. I've been pronouncing K's name wrong. It's K's, not keys. Um, so yeah, so edge blocks is a, a nice bridge between block coding and Python code. So it depends what you want to use. And, and again, there's going to be experts for you to ask. So try and think of any questions now and you can bring them to the sessions and go help. OK. Ah, oh, Patricia has just mentioned that there is a simulator as well. So when we were looking at that, you'll see over here, if I shake it, it should do. There you go. It tells you the temperature. So it's like a little simulator so you can actually 
work out you know how your code's going to work it is more difficult if you're actually attaching things to the pins but um that's in advanced pins but you can say that you've attached something so you can read from a pin so if you've attached a temperature sensor to pin one you can probably analog read pin one i would say um and then you can get temperature that way so there's ways to attach things and then work out how you're going to get that information. I'm going to go back to my slides and there's a little wait. Uh, Robert has asked where the links are. I've done a document, but we're having trouble uploading the files. So we're going to put them on the CRS website um, and then those links will be there as a little document for you to use. Back to. The world of sensors. OK, sorry, I was I was doing that multitasking thing where you, I'm reading the chat. At least I'm not doing it with my mouth wide open. So there we go. Right. We've not looked at a video and I'm going to move on quite swiftly because I'm realizing I'm getting quite near to the end of my time to um, web based data collection. So one of the other things you can do if you really want to show off is you can collect your data on the Internet. So, um, for example, this one is using an Adafruit board. I I think it's a Feather Hazar, it's called, and it's an Arduino based board. And you can see that the sensors are connected up to it there. You can see there's a humidity sensor, which white one that looks like a little grid. And then there is, uh, I think that one is, well, that might be the temperature sensor because there's some wires going underneath into the plant pot, which might be measuring the humidity of the soil. So I'm not entirely sure which way around it is but they're connected up to it. You can see the wires going to the pins and it uses a system that Adafruit have developed. And again, I've linked that. And yes, uh, sorry, Patricia is saying that there's loads of Arduino stuff. I have linked all the Arduino stuff as well in my links document as well. So there's, there's a good thing about this is that you can share your data. It does look slick, but the thing is your plant pot data is going to the internet and it's going all the way over to the internet and all the way back. So you're sending the information about the plant pot in your house pretty much around the world. So that's, that may be a disadvantage. Um, and also it can be complicated. You have to do things like you have to get keys and keys are like basically your way of making sure that it's your data going into your little app there on the phone. But it was all set up fairly straightforwardly and they have some really good tutorials. So you might want to do that. Um, but it's up to you. Um, right, we've had a look at the codes. Oh, yeah. A lot of this stuff depends on your skills. And so if you're going to start doing a project that is really, really complicated and it's just going to stress you out, I would suggest it's probably not the best thing to do. Why don't you start, start small and then have the ideas of what you could build it into for the future? So when I'm going to do the judging, I'm also going to be looking mostly at your ideas and the way that you think it might work. So if you don't know how to do the coding, you could show me that you've had a go at doing the coding, but this is where you got stuck and this is what you would like it to do. So don't worry too much if you're having problems with unfamiliar things, especially since some of you might not even have these devices at home. I'm kind of lucky in that I'm just generally surrounded by tech and junk. So I always have these things. Um, but if you don't have it, I'm not going to be marking people down on that. So your skills work to your skills and sort of flourish in your at the edges of what you can do. One uh, almost final thing is power consumption. If you're going to be putting your Internet of Things device um, in your house, like, for example, a lot of people have an Alexa, that's plugged into the wall and you don't really have to worry about whether it's going to run out of batteries. But if you're making something that measures, uh, I don't know, the conditions in your rabbit hutch, then you might want to have it running off external power. So I've got power bank here and on most power banks, you can see on the back, there's usually some um, description of how much it can hold and how much it can put out. So um, on this one, this holds I can't read it. 10,000 milliamp hours. A Raspberry Pi uses 500. So basically, if I know this holds 10,000 and this uses 500 an hour, 
then I can work out how many hours it's going to last for. And if you want to do the maths, you can do the maths because I'm on the spot and I'm doing that panic thing where I can do maths, but I can't do maths on camera. So 10,000, 500. If it was 1,000, it would last 10 hours, but it can do twice that. So 20 hours, 20 hours. It could run for 20 hours off one of those. So enough to go overnight and see how, how the sort of temperature is going for your bunny. But then you'd have to swap over the power packs. So some things are going to use different amounts of power and you have to take that into consideration. The more you attach to it, the more it's doing, the more power it's going to use. And a brief history of weatherproofing. So if I'm going to put something outside, because we're talking about maybe making an environmental monitor, it might be outside. It might be inside. It might be working out how much noise you can hear from the road inside your house, but it might be outside. So something like a lunchbox is really good for that. So lunchboxes tend to be waterproof because you don't want your sandwiches going soggy. The best type are the ones called click and locks. I think that's the brand name, but you can get knockoff versions. And they have like this little click thing and a rubber seal on the inside of the lid. And that's the best way to sort of waterproof something. So you can put your device and uh, a battery and all the other things it needs probably inside there. Is it easy to get a solar panel for outside? Um, Poundland is open, isn't it? So um, I tend to rip solar panels off things from Poundland because you can get quite a decent amount from them. They tend to have, if you get like those garden lights, you can get a garden light for one or two pounds. And it's got a solar panel on the top. It's got a little LED inside and some reflectors. And it's got a single, um, usually an AA battery. And you can take those out and you can see that it will do a trickle charge to the AA battery. But it might be enough current to get a small Arduino running. So it depends very much on what you're doing with it. That was Emma's question. Um, you can get solar panels, but I wouldn't rely on it because the sun changes, which means that the energy through your solar panel changes, which means it might dip below the amount that your device needs. And if it dips below that amount, then your device will stop working. So solar panels are something to do. And if you want to start experimenting with solar panels, take apart some stuff from Poundland because other pound shops are available because it's cheap. Uh, and finally, making it look good with this when I've sort of stuck it in my plant, I don't want it to look like it does, basically. I wanted all that ugly wiring and stuff to be hidden. So what I did was I thought, what goes in a plant? Other plants in a plant pot. So I made this out of wood, painted it up, and stuck it to the front of it. So I made like a little holder. You can see, maybe, can you see that? So the raspberry pie is stuck on the back of it there with its moisture sensor there. I've also got a little LED that shines through the little eyes on it that lights up red when it needs um, needs watering. So I'm gonna stop talking now because we're getting to the end of the session and a lot of people are, are starting to kind of run out of their time now. So if we have any questions, now is a good time to ask. Um, I've already said that the links will be um, available through the CRS website. Um, and hopefully uh, Michael will be able to give everybody a link to that or Patricia can. Um, the session has been recorded as well. So you've got a copy of that that you can go back and, and see me waving sensors around ad infinitum. Oh, no, I've just gone to the top of the chat instead of the bottom of the chat. That was good, wasn't it? It doesn't seem like there's any questions at the moment, which might be nice and easy. Uh, the pin configuration of a Raspberry Pi, I would say have a look at pinout.xyz. Um, I've just tried to type it in there, but oh, it's there we go. Um, am I interested in you submitting code? Um, if you've done it, yes. If you submit the code, that would be nice to see. Um, if you haven't done any code, then what you could do is pseudo code, which is basically where you write the steps of what it's going to do, a bit like a flow chart. So pseudo code would also be useful. So if you're just taking your first steps into it, I'm, I would be looking for that instead. So uh, an instruction of how it's going to work rather than just like, here's a box. It does all these things. I'll be like, wow. Um, 
Okay, thanks for the nice comment. Um, the form was something that Michael had the link to, so I think he's going to do that form again. Don't forget there is that Google form, so if you could fill out that, that would help people as well. Um, and the story in the chat as well. Sorry about the sort of half doing half thing. The Google form is the one, yeah, Gabrielle. If you have any questions as well. Sorry, just um, to drop, we're going to oh, post the form in just a second. Excellent, thanks. Um, I see Shreyas is oh, using yeah. a oh, circuit playground as their picture. I quite like that. So Richard's just posted the link to the form there. Bonnie, there are files that I tried to share, but I will be sharing them um, shortly. So they'll be on the Cirrus website. If you have any questions, you can also email. I think it's info. That's Sarah. Someone's going to tell me that one. Info at sarahs.org.uk. Okay. Oh, crikey. What have I done there? Info at sarahs.org.uk, was it? Oh, yeah, I just stuck the link. We've right. all oh. typed it now. Look there at that. Amazing. Okay. So it looks like the, the permissions on the form need sorting out. That's somebody else's document, so they're going to have to do that one. I do have all these links we'll are going to be in the document. Right Say again? Right, we'll sort the form out, the permissions problem on the form, and get straight back to you with that. Remember to check the website, uh, check the YouTube channel, which we're now, uh, we'll now post this up. And if you want updates on when things are posted on the website and when things are posted on the YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter. Uh, I'll put that link up there as well. Cool. And so this is the document that will be up there. So it contains the, the links to all the sort of ideas that you might need. Uh, uh, Aram's asking, are there any central repository where people generally upload the internet project, things, projects with code? So what I'm looking at here is the links. Uh, the links. So we've got projects with Raspberry Pi here. Or we've got Instructables, which are crowdsourced. So there's some really good ones on there. There's also some really badly explained ones. So take those ones with a pinch of salt. Microbit have some projects on there as well. Hackspace magazine is a brilliant one that you can download PDFs for free. So there's also a subscription if you wanted to buy uh, an actual subscription, but you can download the PDFs for free and there's loads of old projects in them. Um, Adafruit was that way of connecting to the internet, so that's not a project one. And there's also an Arduino project hub as well. Um, Gabrielle's, we talked about ideas and how to find or form a team. We uh, we're going to talk about ideas tomorrow in Kisha's session and how to find or form a team, I think, is up to you. Um, I would say if you have a social group with anybody that you're actually allowed to be in contact with, then you could form a group that way. Otherwise, you can just work on your own if you prefer. Um, also, there's um, a question about sort of security stuff. How much do Internet of Things developers think about secure coding? In general, they don't. Um, in general, they, they need to do more work on it, to be fair. Um, but I think for what we're doing, it's it's fairly straightforward stuff, and I don't think there's going to be too many problems. But if you were making something like this as an industrial device, especially if there's something connected to a, a whole factory or something like that, something critical, then, yes, you would have to be a lot more aware of it. Uh, Sam is asking if I know some cloud data. data yeah, um, I've logged on on there. So uh, there's this Adafruit one. There's also, um, if you're doing environmental data, there's something like Luftdaten.com, which is a German one, uh, which records weather data. So air quality, temperature, pressure, things like that. There are lots and lots of cloud databases. I'll see if I can add it into the links one before I send it out to people. So that's hopefully answered your question, Samuel. Um, Gabrielle, I'm sure I would form a team with you if I could, but I can't because I'm judging. So um, if anybody um, wants to form a team, then maybe if you commented on the Seras Twitter account when they do their posts about the things to say, does anyone want to form a team? You might find some compatriots that way. That might be the best way to do it. Social media being social and all that. Um, Zubia, the links are going to be a document I'm going to put on the Seras website so you can use that. Uh, Patricia's also mentioned Thing Speak. Thank you for reminding me about that. I'll put that in the links as well. I 
Okay, we're sort of pretty much three o'clock. So if you have more questions, I'm going to stay on for about 10, 15 minutes and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, otherwise, if you need to dash, I'm not going to be offended. That's great. Thanks so much. That was a, that was a brilliant talk. No problems. Um, everyone do please you know, stay if you like, as, as Tennis says, for kind of 10, 15 minutes and um, we can try and answer your questions. Yeah, I'm just going to add in, what have we got? Things to speak. You can see me adding it in as we go. But there's a bit of a delay and I can't type. <laughs> you can never type when people are watching. Is it Things to Speak? Oh, good question. A link to the Sarah's YouTube channel uh, is... Da -da -da -da. I've got it on here. Let me go back. There we go. I'll pop that in the chat as well. Yeah, th thanks for that, Tony Prescott, and, and also oh, no, Tom's already through, done it through the Seras website. Um, we'll provide links to all our other outlets, and we've also got the Twitter um, account that you know we'd love you to follow. Uh, Samuel's asking, do I have a Raspberry Pi Zero or Zero W? That's a very good question. Is it a Zero W because it has Wi-Fi? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, there, there will be. Uh, we, we've got a, uh, a Google Doc channel with the slides from today and Stephanie's yesterday. That again, you can find details of on the website and the Twitter feed. Yeah. What was the other one we mentioned? We mentioned things, but there was another one for um, cloud stuff. Oh yeah, Patricia mentioned something. Patricia mentioned things, speak. I can't remember if there was another one or not. No, I'll just check out things to speak and add that in. So there should be on there. Weather data. Ah, yes, that was it. Luft Darton. Luft Darton. Oh, spelling is atrocious today. Sorry. <laughs> I'll put those in when I've had a proper look, but as you can tell, my, my too many tabs open and my brain is going blip. I would say bye to the people who are leaving, but they won't be able to hear me, so <laughs> bye in advance for anybody who's going. Okay, I don't think we're going to have any more questions, so I'm just going to turn my camera stuff off so I can finish up these uh, links but i'm still on the still keeping an eye on the chat okay